Well, every year people plant trees, shrubs, all kinds of grasses for whitetails. And unfortunately, a lot of those are missing the mark for your intentions and your goals. You know, it's pretty easy to learn how to plant something correctly, how to plant a fruit tree, how to plant a tree, how to plant switchgrass. I mean, look up right now how to look for, or how to plant switchgrass, how to plant switchgrass for whitetails, for deer, for wildlife. All my content will come up at the top and there's so many other people, professional uh, tree arbor arborists. Uh, how to chainsaw a tree, how to complete a face cut. I mean, look up so many different things when it relates to deer habitat. And it allows you to do things right, like plant some of these trees right here, but a lot of times it's missing the mark. So I wanted to go through what I think are the best five trees or tree categories that you can plant on your land. But not only that, we're not just gonna run down the list and say oak, aspen, red maple, box, elder, conifer, and just leave it at that. I wanna talk about the strategy of each one because each one, has a different individual strategy and that's what you can take and then apply back to your land and you know ultimately determine if it's a good fit or not. And we'll start with oak right here. That's why I have a question mark. Oak is a great compliment. I also included oak in my top worst trees for deer or plantings for deer. And the reason why is because oak is great, but it is not the end all be all to planting trees. In fact, if I was looking at property to purchase, which I am right now, the fact that it has oaks or not on it will not be in any way at all a determining factor for purchasing that land or not. I'd rather see diversity of habitat, elevation change, edges, the way it lays in compared to another property, the neighboring concerns, access, there's so many other concerns and soil and ability to plant immediate food plots. We can go on and on, but um, the fact that it has or does not have oak on it will not be a determining factor. I love oak. It's a complement to high quality browse. It is not something that you can dictate and define a deer herd movement. Yes, it does attract deer at certain times of the year. For example, white oaks dropping in September, just incredible. Red oaks in October, they can represent, especially on public land, some incredible areas to hunt on a weekly or monthly basis, not for the entire season. I love oak on public land. A remote stand of oaks on an island, a remote stand of oaks on a southwest facing slope in Ohio, and I can think of one right in my head where it holds the most rubs or scrapes in the area that I've ever seen. And, uh, and it's because of those oaks, because of those white oaks in that case. But two, three weeks later, they're gone. And it doesn't hold that attraction for deer for very long. And so unlike browse, where you can actually dictate that the deer will bed in this location because they have high quality browse in, in terms of the regen species like box elder, red maple, aspen, and add ash to that and other species too. Those species, because of the regeneration, regeneration is available in October, November, December, January, February, March, all fall and winter long, and that's consistency. Whitetails relate to consistency. They want to be consistent. They want to hold the same patterns every day, and if nothing changes, that's low stress to them. Deer live by stress. They're creatures of stretch. When a wounded buck is trying to make a decision of turning left or right, and he's, he's trying to go hide somewhere, he's trying to get away from you, he's just trying to find his happy spot and, and bed down, he's going to make that decision based on stress. If there's a road here, a busy highway, kid playing basketball in the backyard, he might turn to the right and not the left and go by that stress. You can count on that. So even without a blood trail, if you make decisions, he could have gone to point A or point B. If B is less stressful, he probably went that way. And when it comes to deer, they don't want change in their world if they can help it. They make major changes, especially mature bucks, not so much does on a monthly and annual basis. So oaks, although they're great to complement your brows, and your regeneration, your woody substance that they have to have during their bedding hours, they are not that number three out of five feeding of the day, which represents that holding food source on private land that you can maintain for the entire year. And why do you wanna maintain it for the entire year? Because if you have gaps in holes of attraction and nutrition on your food sources or your land, the deer are going to leave. They're going to leave, they're going to reestablish somewhere else, and if that happens, are they back 
Are they not back? Is that going to affect your hunt? But it certainly influences whether you can be the actual herd influencer in the area or not. So oaks, always a great compliment, but you have to have the browse species first. So oak is not the lowest hole in the bucket when it comes to daytime cover, daytime browse, daytime food source when deer in their bedding hours. Actual hardwood regener re regeneration, woody shrub trips, briars, early successional growth, that's what makes up that cover choice. So what I like with oaks, instead of looking at them as a main food source because they are not, they're inconsistent, then I wanna add those back in my hardwoods. I want to plant those oaks in locations where deer have browse, and this is another browse option, but it's a continuation and a complement to the browse that's already there for the entire season, not the browse itself. I've seen far too many landowners take out some of these good species of regeneration in favor of the oaks uh, under the guise of a wildlife plan by some resource professional. I've seen this many times over, and what they're left with is no regen, no bedding, the deer bedding on their neighbors, and a limited food source. So just think about that with oak. It's a great tree. It's also one of the worst trees, depending on your focus and your understanding of how oak contributes to the overall use of whitetails on a daily basis. Aspen. Aspen up north and regeneration, aspen clear cuts, poplar, um, just refer to it aspen. Um, but that's what sets the tone for wildlife habitat and attraction for not only whitetails, but grouse, snowshoe hares up north, cottontails lower. It's very prolific, 7,000 shoots per acre. Aspen shoots up from the root system. That's why people talk about, well, aspen are hard, hard to hinge cut. Well, you shouldn't be hinge cutting aspen. I don't care if someone can. I've hinge cut aspen before on a wood edge, big giant aspen where you needed immediate screening from heavy log and top. And I did that with a plunge cut. I'm not even gonna show you guys how to do it because it's somewhat dangerous cut where you're plunging into the side of the tree in a vertical fashion, you're creating a hinge, and you can create hinges on giant old poplar if you want to, but it's not a standard practice. It's not something I'd advise. There's a lot of things that I might do or tweak a little bit that I'm not gonna talk about or have a video on because uh, for example, using 2,4-D for switchgrass. It's great in a perfect world, but if you spray a little bit too much, if you overlap, if you have to turn a lot, you kill your young switch and you injure your older switch. So I just don't make recommendations about that on a, on a wide basis on, online because I want you guys to experience success. I'm always looking at the lowest hole in the bucket. Aspen shoots out of the root system, the lateral root system. You can get up to 7,000 shoots per acre, some say more, but regardless, let's just say a lot. And it's all deer browse, deer food, deer cover, wildlife cover, wildlife habitat. And, and really in the north, it's probably one of the most prolific and important tree species that you can have on public or private land because you can find a spot in, of oaks, and I'll say northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, upstate New York, areas of Pennsylvania, big woods of Kentucky. You can find an area of oak where it will attract deer for that limited amount of time. But if you find an aspen regeneration and clear cut, and you find various stages, so you have that pole timber that actually represents cover, and then you have the aspen regeneration and clear cuts that represent food next door, you can find that perfect combination in some remote location on public land, let alone if you actually complete it on your own private land. Very important species, count yourself lucky if you have it. One of the attractions, this parcel in Minnesota, you know, aside from the area, the topography and the access is that we have a lot of clusters of aspen regeneration and aspen. And so we were able to knock some down, Dylan and I, Dylan filming me knocking it down um, the other day. And I can't wait for that regeneration to explode this year. It's also a great place to add uh, red cedar off to the side where we're getting sunlight into it. But very important tree species on this property, uh, let alone in more northern states and northern regions. Again, count yourself lucky if you have it. Red maple. Red maple is a little bit different than soft maple as it's highly preferred for deer browse. It's also very a very prolific regeneration tree species. And so to actually cut that tree, hinge cut a red maple. And you can hinge cut red maple seven, eight inches, especially if you're using a habitat hook or tool where you can actually push it over and you're not cutting that far through that trunk uh, to make that tip over and actually hinge. You're hinge cutting that waist high 
And the reason for that is once you have that waist tie, you can count on its side sprouting. You want those sprouts to be within reach of the deer so they can actually eat them so that they can actually relate to the cover, that side cover. You don't want to cut it so high that they can't reach the food or don't have the cover, that's kind of silly. You know, sometimes I'll complete high hinge cuts, but it's almost, um, and not very often, but it's because I want that tree to fall over another tree. So if you cut it too low and there's another trunk or top that it's going to hit when it's on the way down and then pivot up, you can rich, rip that hinge and rip that tree off from its base. Red maple sprouts from the base like most like hardwoods and but the difference is it's very desirable uh, for whitetails and it's very prolific so you can actually hinge some of the first hinge cuts I ever did back in the late 90s were on red maple and I haven't been there in the last six or seven years but I was six or seven years ago those hinge cuts were still living let's say 16 17 years later and I've seen hinges of red maple and soft maple on properties that have been alive for 15 years and what do you do you just hinge them again so you have that side growth. Once they're going up, they get to two inches, three inches in diameter. You can hinge cut those. You can also tie it down. Tie it down in the off season. It's a half inch, quarter, three quarter inch, one inch whip coming off the side and side sprouting. You can just tie it back down to the trunk and it'll come back up again. You can literally create a living bush of goodness for whitetails on the top of that hinge and you can maintain it for decades to come. So people say that hinge cuts a waste of tree. It does take seven, 10 years down the road to maintain it again, but you can maintain it for decades. And if, and if you're doing that as anything but a waste, in fact, it's the opposite. Because typically when people are harvesting timber, they're allowing those, that base to regenerate, those stems to come up, they never touch them again until they harvest in 60 years or 40 years or 80 years, whatever the rotation is. To me, that's more of a waste of the resource if you're looking at it for wildlife. And red maple is definitely a wildlife tree that has a lot of flexibility and use for. Box elder, in the same class, but even more prolific. The great thing about box elder, if you like hinge cutting, you like cutting timber, uh, box elder is always leaning some way. And what's good about that is you know where it's going down. It's very easy to put a back cut on a 14 inch box elder and let it slowly tip down because there's so much moisture in there. If you take a box elder branch, break it in half, for one, it has a real pungent smell that you, you'd be used to if you're cutting box elder. It brought me back to memories back in the 90s where I would get dropped off on a fence row, step from the pickup truck onto a box elder tree, go up into a stand location, break some branches off for that stand. And I remember that smell. And obviously when you're in your teens and your 20s and you're hunting and you're excited and you get that smell, you remember those sight smells, sounds of hunting. That's what Those are the memories that you know last a lifetime. And, uh, and so I have some fond memories of that pungent smell when it comes to box elder. But box elder is very easy to tip right over slowly. And then when it hits the ground, a lot of portions where it hits the ground is actually going to create another tree that you can hinge cut in the future. You can actually expand a box elder growth. I was in Minnesota, Southeast Minnesota, and it was uh, probably 10 years ago. And we were trying to screen access back and forth along a, a long fence row. And uh, it was just a shame because they had cut every tree on that fence row. And now they're looking at, you know, how can we screen this? Well, they were talked into by a resource professional to cut all their box elder along that, that fence row. And that was exactly the type of habitat that they could have used to create that screen initially. And I've seen box elder grow six to eight feet or more just in one season after you hinge it and regenerate. We've, we've learned that the hard way by clearing stands out in May, June. Uh, box elder that we had to shoot over to a water hole back in the day. And then we go back there to hunt in October and the shoots are already running up into our sight window because they grew so fast. And uh, box elder can be a great tree. What's really nice about red maple and box elder is that they actually have seeds on their branches that you can grab and plant out into open areas for early successional growth and diversity pockets. It's free, it's very easy. Just throw them on the soil, make sure you get rid of the weeds in those locations, especially spray for grass in there because if it's not switchgrass, it's not cover. And if it's any grass, it's not food. And so you want those to be exposed on, on open soil and they'll take root just like they do everywhere else. And, uh, and that's why box elder is an outstanding tree for wildlife. Now conifer, I love conifer. Conifer, of course, is not a browse unless it's white cedar, but I don't know how many of you have ever tried to plant white cedar. 
and get it established, but is, is nearly impossible. We even had a client in the Thumb area of Michigan that transplanted six to eight foot white cedar trees to try to make a deer yard on his land. And uh, what's crazy, when I was living up in the UP, I ran a lot of rabbits, I had beagles, and uh, I would you know, spend the winter time in cedar swamps. And it was crazy how many cedar swamps had cedar down to the ground and deer just weren't there because unless there's some type of hardwood regeneration, ag fields, food plots, those deer don't like to stay in those cedar trees because they have no other food. Now in the UP of Michigan, there's traditional deer yards where deer will travel to those green barns where there's not a lot of food. And on a tough winter, the biggest and tallest survive. Uh, bucks hardly ever die in those cedar swamps, even though they don't have a lot of food because they go into the winter with a lot larger tank compared to their overall body size. That's why 50% of all fawns die in a UP northern winter. It's up to 50,000 fawns every single winter that die in the UP of Michigan. And it's basically those browsed out green barns and there's not much you can do about it because in a lot of those areas, they've tried to replant cedar and they don't grow. The conditions change, the soil changes, and what conditions were great and ripe for those cedars to start sprouting and grow in the early 1900s, late 1800s after the area was clear cut are not the same conditions today. What they have found success in the deer yards are strip cutting. And they get that aspen to regenerate, the red maple to regenerate in strips, and then they have the ultimate cover of the cedars and that green barn thermal effect right next door. So again, it goes back to the combination. In those cases, the soft maple, the aspen, and the conifer. Conifer represents a fourth type of bedding habitat. The four types of bedding habitat that I identified and wrote about and published in Quality Whitetails 10, 12 years ago, you have uh, briars, regeneration of grasses, weeds, that's one class. Then you have shrubs, second class, conifers, a third, and then you have hardwood regeneration. Those are the four bedding types that I see. If you can get any two or three of those to happen in one spot, it's a great idea. So when you're combining aspen regeneration, red maple, and conifer together, then you can have the ultimate form of bedding, and that's the case certainly up in the UP of Michigan, where without those areas, deer simply couldn't survive. You couldn't have a sustainable population. So very important. I love conifer, but you have to think about what conifer. You know, for um, edging and screening, I love the combination of that long-term lower branch spruce that takes place in 10, 12, 14 years of screening for screening. And then I have that complement of a quick growing pine like red pine alongside it. But you're planning on those red pine branches to be gone in 10, 12, 14 years and the spruce to take over at that point. I love spruce, white pine, and cedar. White pine will hold its lower limbs too. The problem is with Norway spruce, white pine, deer love to eat them, more so than white spruce and certainly red cedar. The problem is with red cedar, deer like to rub them. It's a preferred rubbing uh, tree. Uh, jack pine's actually a pretty decent one too, but not much cover value. Uh, loved by snowshoe rabbits. They'll actually burrow and live under the jack pine during the winter time. And then a very favored tree for making mock scrapes with a vertical branch, but certainly for being scraped and rubbed on by, by whitetails. So there's some good value in jack pine. I encourage you to pick a spruce that is best for your soil type. Don't look at it as white spruce is better than Norway or Norway is better than white. Nor a white spruce tends to be less picked on by deer and eaten. It's a lower uh, preferred brow species. And it takes sandy soil, light soil, and it can take up to full shade, but it might only grow an inch a year in that full shade. Norway spruce, spruce needs a full sun. It needs good soil, but it's a lot faster grower. So if you protect those areas, you protect where you're planting your spruce and you're out in the open, you have decent soil, Norway spruce might be the answer. If you're completing cuttings back in the timber like we're doing, and I encourage my clients, then spruce might be a great choice. And now red cedar is a pretty decent choice for back in the woods too. The great thing about cutting popple, uh, that complete cut on a tree like that, uh, cutting mature timber to let sunlight in, now you have tops and debris that you can stab those conifers back into and get them protected on a sunny knoll or a south facing area of your woods, whether it's flat or hilly. And now you have that perfect combination of hardwood regeneration combined with conifer. And then again, you can maintain that area and that bedding area for years to come to make sure you have enough sunlight hitting those conifers 
um, in that area because red cedar needs full sun, white spruce doesn't. White pine is great because it's considered a wildlife tree, low hanging branches, very large. It, a mature white pine open grown almost has the same look of a giant maple in someone's yard. Uh, very big branch structure, often multi-trunked when it's like that. But deer pick on it heavily. So when you're cutting back in the woods and you can cage those, those seedling growth with white pines, uh, great idea. And I encourage you to, it's very fast. I planted 5,000 trees in one weekend, 4,000 trees in another weekend in the past. And with a tree spade, and someone helping and seedlings, you can throw a lot of trees out there quickly. And that's my approach. I'd rather put a lot in a spot. Don't go by the wildlife spacings of 10, 12, 15 feet. You're looking for actual conifer growth with the thought that some are going to die. I'd rather take more of a shotgun approach than going in there and fencing a few. I've, I've had clients do that where they've had a forester come in and plant red cedars or large uh, conifers at the expense of thousands and thousands of dollars um, and if it were me, I'd take that approach of planting seedlings, seedlings that shotgun approach, planting them clo closer, complementing that hardwood regeneration. Um, you don't need to worry about thinning white pine, spruce out uh, in the future red cedar because you're not going to complete a timber harvest in the first place. So always think about conifer as a complement to these really good regen species of aspen, red maple, box elder, ash. You can include some other ones in there. And, and as far as ash goes, great, most are dying, great to cut those down right now, get that regeneration. I know foresters might disagree on this, even amongst themselves, but there's a thought that if you keep that young, that ash young and in a young state, then that emerald ash borer can't get in through the bark. Um, when it's young, it doesn't have those deep grooves and emerald ash borer will pass by and then you'll have ash. But bottom line is if you keep cutting it, it'll keep re regenerating. It's probably one of the most prolific regeneration species. And that's why as a complement to conifer, as a complement to oak, you have to have this regen. Um, and, and that's that base form of cover that you need. Of course, aspen, red maple, box elder, conifer, especially uh, red cedar, maybe uh, um, jack pine, scotch pine is considered junk. And if you notice, that makes up a large percentage of the trees I recommend for whitetails and wildlife plantings. If you want to plant trees for harvest and for timber production, think walnuts. Even though the money you spend is not going to be a good return, it's a very poor investment as far as money-wise. So if you're doing it just to get some money in the future at cut 60 years and cut 90 years, um, you're going to be waiting a long time and you're better off probably putting your money just into a savings account that gets a very low percentage rate over the years and you'll probably do better and you really can't plant those for wildlife if you're looking at money trees then consider hard maple cherry even oak especially red red oak and but you're waiting a very long time and you have to devote a large amount of space for those so um, not that I encourage you not to do that but always keep in mind that those trees unless they're a complement to something else that's actually, that actually has wildlife value. There's really no value at all uh, to wildlife. So a lot of junk trees. Again, going back to the thought that I always bring up that uh, the lower the value of the uh, timber species and habitat overall, the higher the wildlife value. The higher the money trees or dollar amount, the lower the wildlife value. And finally, got fruit. And we'll even throw in there, just I make this a point of soft mass. And let's include chestnuts in there, uh, persimmons, pears, crab apples, apples. A variety is always best. I love fruit trees, but again, that was in my bad trees to plant. It's also a good tree to plant, obviously a good, good variety. Um, but you want to cluster them. You want to have several varieties for cross-pollination. You want to cage them. You want to make sure you do it right. You want to keep the mice, the rabbits out. I've even seen people use crushed gravel at the base. Heavy fencing, three quarter inch pipes to hold the fence up. Deer will crush them. I had someone say, oh, I, all you need to do is use tree tubes. Yeah, tree tubes work great for your front yard, but if you have a lot of deer in your front yard, they're gonna run those tree tubes over, kill the tree, and all your money's gone for those trees and whatever the expense and the amount of time. Because it's not just the amount of money you spent, it's the amount of time that you put them in there. So obviously fruit trees are great. I encourage you to add them to quality food. 
fruit trees are not going to be just like acorns and oaks, but I would argue a little bit better than oaks, that uh, they're not going to define the deer movement the entire hunting season. And if you're letting the deer focus somewhere else for weeks or months at a time during the deer season, you're not going to be a herd influencer. And to me, being a herd influencer is easy to do if you have great browse during the day, you have that great food source and high quality diverse food plots in the afternoon. Those food plots all need to be planted in the same diversity spread out through your land. You're not just putting brassicas here, clover here. So you have that one-two punch of food, meaning you have the two feedings during the day during the bedding area, that third holding feeding of the day where they hold on your land, and then hopefully go somewhere else after dark and let them consume someone else's resources. And if you take that focus, you build your land around that foundation of high quality trees, high quality food plots, you limit your access, you have controlled access so you're not spooking deer off your property. Everyone says, well, you have a sanctuary. Your sanctuary should encompass over 50% of your land. Your sanctuary should include the bedding areas, but most importantly, it should include your food plots too. Because if your food plots are not included in that sanctuary, you're not gonna have those bedding areas filled by anything decent other than some high risk tolerant does and fawns that fill your property and don't allow you to actually be the herd influencer. Don't grade your property on how many does and fawns you see. Grade your property on balance and your ability to attract and shoot the oldest bucks in the neighborhood because if you're not shooting them, then how can you have a quality herd? I know it takes some time to get used to hunting mature bucks and going after that older age class. So that's not always true, but you can't have a great hunt without a great herd and vice versa. And if you're focusing on these regen trees, these junk trees, fruit trees, and acorns, apples, crab apples, whatever it is to complement either your food plots with the soft mass, persimmons, crab apple, apples, pears, even chestnuts, they should all complement your high quality food plots, but they are not going to be the driving factor for your property for the entire year. Actually, browse is better to have than fruit trees or acorns. You might disagree with me on that, but I want you to actually be the one that's holding the deer all hunting season long because they have consistent browse in their bedding areas. That consistency is not going to be supplied by adding fruit trees or acorns on your land. Those are great compliments. That's why they're included in this list. If you maintain all this focus and you're planting the right trees and you have that right drive and guide and goal for the entire hunting season, then you're gonna be on track to be the herd influencer and that's what I want you to be. Make sure you follow these top trees when you're planting this year and consider, always again, ask yourself why? Is this an actual fit for my land? How is this going to help me? How has this helped other people? And you'll be on track for not only great deer habitat plantings that actually use up a wise resource of your time and money and reflect that in your results, but you'll ultimately have a great hunt this fall. Hey guys, I really appreciate you watching today's video. And we're out here having some fun today. We're planting some switchgrass, cutting some timber, making some bedding areas, but most importantly, we're putting it all together and that's critical. Any habitat improvements that you're making, you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot. You have to link those together so that it helps your hunt this fall. Really, I encourage you to check out my web classes. The link is in the description. It's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now.